It's kind of long, but it ends with Monica Conyers feeling my balls. Okay, I'm just going to go like this. I'm, I'm driving to see Monica Conyers. I'm kind of new, and uh, I'm kind of new to the city, and what I did was she had called another the city council president Shrek. You guys remember that? Oh, he's just acting like a fool. So I brought some middle school kids to sit in the city council chairs and ask her questions. She got, she got in a fight with a 12-year-old and was destroyed by the 12-year-old. Okay, so then they start making the, you know, CBS early show and all this, and she keeps losing this fight to this 12-year-old. And uh, so I go to meet her for a drink, give her some advice, you know, like some advice. And so I'm uh, driving through the city to, to go see her, a, a place where I used to, you know, deliver my mom's flowers. She had a flower shop. So let me just... Uh... Okay. Now, the, uh, I'm driving by to meet her, and I go by the Reverend C.L. Franklin, Aretha Franklin's dad's church. Okay, and I'm looking at it, and then I start here. I say, before it was New Bethel, the church had been the Oriole Theater, once the headquarters of the Church of Universal Triumph, the, of Dominion of God Incorporated. That congregation was led by a man known as Prophet Jones. During the 1940s and 50s, Jones was one of the most successful showmen evangelists in the country, one of the few black preachers who broke the color barrier and was broadcast nationally by the white-controlled media. The Saturday Evening Post dubbed him the Messiah in Mink. Bejeweled and flamboyant, Jones was one of something of a little Richard of the cloth. He was said to have 400 suits, 4,000 bottles of cologne, and four Cadillac cars with a separate chauffeur for each. His congregants, both black and white and mostly Southerners, alienated by Detroit's culture of concrete and steel, were happy to keep the prophet in riches. He preached from a golden throne and was said to be able to hear God in his right ear, on which he wore a diamond earring to better help with the reception. <laughs> <laughs> prophet Jones' main theological precept was that come the year 2000, all living humans would become immortal. So congratulations. <laughs> In order to reach the millennium, Jones decreed that, quote, women should wear girdles long enough to keep the stomach and buttocks from protruding. He also stipulated that they should wear, wear red nail polish in the evenings and take laxatives once or twice a week. The fall came quickly for the prophet, who in 1956 was charged with making homosexual overtures to an undercover police officer. He beat the rap, but his reputation never recovered. Jones did not come to realize his own prophecies, however. He died in 1973, the year Coleman Young was elected mayor. As the sun set, I drove at, uh, to, look, is another typo. I'm sorry, I'm gonna give you a dollar back. <laughs> As the sun set, I arrived, no, it's not a typo, I'm just nervous. As the sun set, I arrived at Baker's Keyboard Lounge, a jazz club on Livernoy near the Detroit side of the Eight Mile Road, the place my wife's parents used to frequent in the 80s. The bar was full despite the fact that the joint stank like a sewer pipe. Conyers was seated in the back near the stage. It was early summer and she sported a brassy, low-cut, cream-colored top with a tight skirt, exotic stockings, and high heels. The way she was stuffed together, it looked like she was wearing a girdle. She was definitely wearing red nail polish. I ordered bourbon and soda. She ordered tea and lemon and a Caesar salad and a cup of soup. She said she was fasting trying to clean her intestines out to lose weight. We made small talk. You know what I'd like to do after politics, she said. What's that? I'd like to design brassieres for plus size women, she said. I'm sure there's a big future in that, I said, amused. <laughs> she battered her eyelashes coquettishly and crossed her legs with a <laughs> grand gesture, leaning on one side of her hind quarters sweetly toward me. The congressman and I don't spend much time together anymore, but that's our marriage, and it works for us, she cooed. <laughs> I ordered another. <laughs> that's when Monica got to the point. She complained that I'd set her up. I assured her it was not a setup, that Kiara Bell had her own mind, and that it was doing Conyers little good to be complaining in the press that a 13-year-old was disrespectful of her rank. Okay, can we speak as adults, I asked. Go ahead, then. She answered with a barracuda smile. What the fuck is the matter with you, I asked. You're fighting with a kid. <laughs> the smile vanished. Her teeth appeared. I was ready for the nails and a drink in my face. 
She was a plant, Kanye's hissed. She was not a plant. She was right, I said. Look, if I were you, I would go on camera and say the girl reminds you of yourself that growing up in this town, you have to develop a thick skin. You say that she's taught you something about civility and that you're proud of her. It was good free advice. Kanye should have taken it. Instead, she smiled coyly again. She straightened her shoulders, leaned over the table. She patted my chest. Her hand wandered down my torso and lingered on my testicles. She gave a gentle little squeeze. Are you wearing a wire, she asked. No, I said momentarily stunned. That's a roll of quarters, but I'm flattered. I really am. This couldn't be happening, I thought. Girdles and red nail polish and intestinal cleansing and bar fights and sewer pipes and wire taps and eternal life and decay all around. It was insanity. It was outrageous. It was a reporter's dream. Where the hell was I? I paid the bill and left. The sound I sign out said said, Detroit City Limits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no.